And thanks everyone for, for coming. Not that you really had a choice to watch this talk if you came to the other one, but hopefully uh, I'll have something for everyone in this. Um, I'm Phil Nash. I've actually sort of been here, well not in this, on this site, but uh, folks did a couple of times before over the years, so some of you may have seen me before. Uh, and if so, you'll probably know that um, I mostly work in C++, uh, which is going to be part of what we're talking about tonight. But don't worry, if you've never touched C++ before, we're not going to look at any code really. Actually, there's one slide, but it's going to be more about um, the ecosystem around it and uh, some interesting developments. So. so actually, yeah, it's a good, good question actually. Um, how many people here are developers? So, majority, but definitely not all. Of those, who has ever touched a line of C++? Hey. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so who's that doesn't C++ count. <laughs> today? Oh, not sorry, today, but you know, right now. Your, your day job. Just, just one. Okay, well, two. Really. <laughs> all right, that's good. That's a good ratio, I think. Um, I am a developer advocate at Sonar. I should get that plug in, I'm wearing the t-shirt as well. Uh, if you don't know Sonar, we do static analysis tools for, uh, for all languages actually. So I'm not going to talk about that tonight, but if you are interested in talking more about that, then uh, please speak to me afterwards. Um, I had this title, Thoughts on Carbon. I'll come on to what carbon is in a moment. But uh, I decided to change it because there's actually been some more developments since I first proposed this talk uh, a couple of months ago. So new title is What Comes After C++? And say so there is a connection there. So made it a little bit more, more general. Um, now there's this quote from Herb Satter. If you have done C++, you probably know who Herb Satter is. Quite prominent in the community. We'll hear more from him later, actually. He said a few years ago, the world runs on C++. You might think it runs on C, and to some extent, yes, yeah, somewhere between the two. But between C and C++, um, but that code is running just about everywhere. And even your high-level languages, they're probably running on C++. They're, um, the, the tools are written in C++. It all comes down to C++ or C at the end of the day. So, quite important. Um, and really to see where it all fits in, I think it's useful to look at the family tree of, of languages that are important to, to C++ at the bottom there. And it all starts back in the 50s with Algol, the first general purpose programming language. Languages before that were much more specialised. So that's really the modern age of computer programming started with, with Algol. Then it sort of split. And we follow the line down to C on the left hand side. And on the right hand side, it went through similar, uh, a few other languages. Certainly not all languages from the time say just what's relevant to C++ here. What's interesting about this is all the languages on the left they're also the low-level systems languages, which is what our goal starts out as. Uh, very good for that. That's really what C's strength was as a, as a systems language for developing operating systems and, and low-level tools. Whereas on the right-hand side, these are all languages that support high-level abstractions, and they're generally easier to use um, and safer as well. And you'll see that actually there's a couple of languages here actually that Spare the two. C is one of them. The other one's Objective C. We're not really going to talk about that tonight, but it's just interesting to see how it fits in as well. So, that was really C's main reason to come into existence. C was already doing fine in its CFR. Uh, Bjorn Strasrup, who created the language, wanted something that bridged these two worlds low level systems access and high level abstractions, bring the two together. And to a large extent, he succeeded in that. But even C++ itself, there have been multiple versions of it through the years that we should also consider. In fact, it's, it's the whole set. Starting, I mean, the original version, before we even got the name C++ or C with classes, that was in the 70s. 1978, I think. Should have written that down. Um, 83, I think, it got the name C++. But it wasn't until 98 that we got the first standard version. So before then it was just constantly evolving and we just had to keep up and there were different variants and so on. Standardised in 1998. So already we've got a good couple of decades of backwards compatibility with earlier versions starting to, to weigh the language down a bit. Bearing in mind 
it actually inherited a load of technical debt from C, which, as we just saw, there's a legacy going back to the 50s there that it's sort of just kept carrying forwards, particularly from C to C++. And that starts to slow down the development of the language. And in fact, although there was a, um, a study in 2003 as well, um, it's really it's a very minor one that's mostly a bug fix. So you, you might have heard this term C++ 98 slash 03, as if that's a single language version. It's just because there's nothing that meaningful in 03. There wasn't really a language uh, version between 98 and 2011. 13 years. That's where C++ got its reputation uh, for a while as being a bit of a stagnant language and certainly a dated language. Just because of the time involved there. While languages like Java, C Sharp and other modern languages sort of came out of the gate and overtook it. C++11 to some extent did change that. It caused a bit of a, um, a renaissance in the community at least. A lot of interest in the language. But it couldn't undo all of the problems of that technical debt that it's built up over the decades now. But another thing changed in 2011, the C11, because of that experience of such a long time coming for a new standard, decided to change to a different model, what we call the train model. So we decide the schedule in advance every three years, there's going to be a new language version. And whatever's ready at the time, that's what goes in it. So we've got C++14, the new C++17 was coming. And we've got C++20, that's technically the current version, but C++23 is just about ready to go. It should be officially the new language version in next February, I believe. And we even know there's going to be a C++26. And I've seen some proposals from people saying this, this paper target is C++29, because we know it's not going to be ready in time for 26. So we've got that predictability in there, which is nice. The language is definitely moving forwards, but it's still being held back by its legacy. Because one of the principles of the language is backwards compatibility with previous versions. We almost never completely remove something from the language or break something. So it's a bit of a problem. Now, I said that the current language version is C20, and this photo here was, was taken in uh, Prague in 2020, the last meeting of the Standards Committee before all the lockdowns started. The entirety of C++23 uh, has been developed uh, online, but um, in Prague, the committee got together and uh, every time there's a new language version, there's a photo taken of everyone that's present. Um, you might recognise this guy, <laughs> just stuck in there. So yes, I am technically on the committee. Not particularly active, but you could say that some of this is partly my fault at this. So I, I, I should be in there somewhere. I can see where I yeah, Possibly, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so it's partly my fault. Now, the same week in Prague in 2020, well, I think we kicked off actually with uh, this paper from uh, Titus Winters, also quite, quite a big name in the community. Um, ABI now or never. So not only are we being held back by source level compatibility with previous versions, but even ABI compatibility, the binary interface. There's this unwritten rule, well it's actually been written now I think, <laughs> that we actually be compatible with previous versions. We don't do anything that's going to break that, even though that's not actually in the standard anyway. And that's been holding back particularly developments on the performance front. And so Titus was proposing, maybe now's the time we make that breaking change. And, uh, and actually, you know, move the language forward even more. And it was voted down, so we didn't get that. Later the same week, with this proposal from um, uh, Vittorio Romain, Epochs, if you've used Rust, or know anything about Rust, you may have heard of uh, additions, I think it's called there. Basically the same idea. It's a way of having breaking changes in the language, but having versions of the language that you can run side by side. So you've got interoperability built in. Proposal to bring that to C++ sounded really promising. There was some quite um, engaged discussion about it until somebody pointed out a flaw. So, uh, uh, this can't work for this reason. To do with templates, of course. And that was voted down as well. And since then, there have been a 
couple more proposals all to do with trying to address this compatibility problem, introducing breaking changes, fix some of these problems that we've had that have not gone anywhere. So people have been thinking, what, what can we do? But what does come next? And I, I mentioned Rust just now. I mean, well, what about Rust? It's a language that plays in that same space of giving you low level access to systems language, but also high level abstractions. And I would say, actually, yeah, Rust is a great language for that. If you can use Rust, then do. Brilliant. If all of the code that you're writing is all in Rust, then, then that's great. So if you're just using Rust on its own, good. If you do need to interoperate with existing C++ code, then the situation is not quite so good. So if you've got a big legacy code base or you need to use third-party libraries that are in C++, then you can do it, but you're going to have to wrap it in like a C-like interface. And it's, it can be done, but it's not nice. Believe me, I've, I've done that sort of thing before. Another potential problem with Rust, for now at least, is it's still comparatively young language. Um, the ecosystem is still building, it's not quite mature yet. Uh, and there's maybe not enough experienced developers to, to really fill the market. So there are things that can change. I think it's got a promising future ahead of it. But it's this problem of the interoperability with existing C++ that means that this is not really the solution to the C++ problem. But that's exactly what Carbon is intending to solve. So here's where that finally comes in. It's uh, designed as a successor to C++. So whereas Rust is like a replacement language, it plays in the same space, but you have to buy into Rust. A successor language is like moving from C to C++, where you can keep all your old C code. For Carbon, you can keep all your old C++ code, and a seamless interoperability, uh, bi-directional, backwards and forwards, and we'll see that in a moment. So, let's actually have a look at some of the, the key points. So I mentioned it's a successor language, direct interop with C++. Because of that, I mean, if that was the only thing I had going for it, there would be no point, but because of that, you can then have a, a nicer, more modern syntax. And if you've used C++, you know that one of the big problems is all the defaults are backwards. You have to put on this keyword sequence just to get the default behavior that you would like to have to opt out of. Well, in Carbon, it's the other way around, of course. Um, it's also simpler to parse. If you've ever tried to write tooling for C++, you'll appreciate that. Uh, mentioned the backwards defaults. There's a thing to do with generics. It's actually uh, extremely powerful, but a lot to explain right now, so I'm going to skip over that one. Um, perhaps the most interesting part is the, the last one. Because this really addresses the issue of how we got here in the first place. The constant backwards compatibility. What Carbon is saying, well, there's going to be breaking updates. We're going to change the language. We're going to change the syntax to make it better over time. But we're always going to provide a tool to migrate your code from one version to the next. And this is all built on Clang tooling. So Clang is a, um, a compiler, modular compiler system, really, that lets you put tools in at different levels that's going to be faithful to the language. So it's a, it's a great uh, tool set to actually build these tools to migrate code from one version to the next. And this has been done before. If you've used Swift, when Swift was first released in 2014, I believe, they said right up front, we are going to introduce breaking changes, exactly the same thing, and we're going to provide tools to migrate your code to the new version. And they did. The first three or four years, I think, there were lots of really big breaking changes to the language that definitely made it better overall, and they introduced tools to migrate it, and they mostly worked. <laughs> they, would, they would migrate the code, there would be bits you'd stuff to fix up, especially with a large code base. Um, early adopters definitely got a bit burned by that. So I'm interested to see how that works out, because it's going to be basically the same problem. You know, we get you 90% of the way there. But yeah, go, go and be your eyes open on that. But also, I think maybe even the biggest change is in the governance model. It might sound a little bit boring, actually, but I think this is actually what makes the whole thing interesting. So, I should really start by pointing out what the governance model is for C++. So I mentioned the standards committee. That's an ISO standard. 
Uh, now, with an ISO standard, you don't actually have an ISO standards committee, technically. What you have is national bodies around the world, and it's the members of the national body that are part of the ISO standard. And the reason I explain that is because each national body um, can basically set its own rules to, to some degree how they operate, and mostly sort of favours representation from different nations to make sure that you know the whole world is being represented in this standards work. Um, and when that's useful, that, that can actually be quite quite good. Um, but it does mean that it sort of favours representation from nations rather than communities, the language communities. Um, and the other thing, um, the other problem with that is, depending on the national body, but some of them, particularly the US, uh, th their rules say that you can only be a member if your company is a member and you're representing your company. So as well as representation from nations, you have representation from corporations. And sometimes that can be uh, a problem if a particular company says, right, we want this feature in the language or we want to go this direction or hold this back. And they throw enough people in to actually swing the language in their direction. And I've seen that happen. Um, so that could be a problem. So that's the, the ISO model. With Carbon, try to react against that. It's, well, it's an open community that has a leadership team of uh, three members. You can think of them as benevolent dictators, but not for life. So they do intend to replace them every few, every few years to get different representation in there. And it's closely related to the next point, which is a little bit controversial, which is this has been started within Google. To some extent, it's the Google language. The current leadership team said, no, 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 it's not a, it's not a Google language. It just happens to be, that's, that's where we started, but, but they intend it to be led by the community and to have not the Google members be part of the leadership team. So we'll see how that goes. A lot of people are suspicious. I'm sort of mildly suspicious of that. I say mildly because knowing the three individuals who are currently involved, I know that their intentions are probably good, but we'll see where that goes. And they also use uh, modern tools for organising things, GitHub, uh, Discourse, that sort of thing. Very similar actually to the Swift evolution model and uh, Rust, I believe, as well. So they've really thought about how to make this work to be able to keep the language moving forwards without the same problems that have held C++ up over the years. Uh, so I wouldn't show much code. This is the one slide with some code on if you can even read it. But the main thing to, um, to see here is, so this is, um, this is carbon code. Here, um, import, oh here, import CPP library circle.h. It's actually importing a header file, which is actually quite a big deal. If you know C++, when you include a header file, you're basically just copying the text in, in memory, but it's just taking a copy of the text. It's a textual substitution. Importing is more like importing a module. It's a very different thing. Well, it's achieving similar goals. So being able to import that header file into the carbon into carbon code as a module is actually really, really nice. It goes the other way as well. So uh, here, we're including a carbon module as a header file, geometry.carbon.h. Now all of this is happening pretty much on the fly using code generation. Sorry about the camera. <laughs> so it looks seamless, at least in the demos. Again, we'll see how that scales, but that's the interoperability side by side. Um, and it's all low or zero overhead. So uh, down here, we've got a, a vector. So the array type in C++ basically, it's a library type. Um, and it's used, it comes in here as a slice which is like a, a view into the same memory. So there's basically no overhead in just using one C++ type from carbon type and vice versa. Uh, I, I could go on, but I think you get the idea. So this is what um, John McAriff, who introduced it to the world, the talk at uh, C++ North earlier this year said. Because they don't know this is actually going to be the next thing, but they want to find out together. 
So it's part of what comes next for C++. So I think that's like a very honest um, appraisal of where this language sits. It's not, it's not guaranteed, it's not like, yeah, we're going to put all our weight into making sure this is it. No, it's like, well, this is the problem, here's our solution, let's see if that's a part of it. But is it the only one? And this is why I changed the title. <laughs> because, as I said, there's a lot of people that have been asking us this question of how can we solve the problem with backwards compatibility in C++ and the governance model and the evolution model. So, there's actually a few, and let's say, um, since I first proposed this talk, there's a couple that have actually now been formally announced. Uh, mostly at CPPCon in September. The first one, yeah, it's called CPP2. <laughs> And this is being proposed by Herb Sasser, we saw him at the start. Now he's, he's currently the convener of the C++ Standards Committee, sort of like chairman, it's not quite, but think of it that way. It's, it's pretty high up, and he's proposing this, uh, this new language, CVP2. It's sort of a new language, it's more like a sidecar language, I think. The interesting thing about this is it's, um, it's a different model to Carbon. Uh, you know, I didn't mention with Carbon, the way it interops, interoperates with C++ is at the AST level. That's how it gets around the, the syntax issue that C++ and C had. CPP2 uh, actually is like a, a front-end, uh, a transpiler, so it compiles down to C++. In fact, it compiles down to readable C++ that you might write yourself. So it's actually a fairly low investment. If you start using CPP2 and you say, no, I want to go back to C++, you can just take the generated code and work with that. And he's been working on the ideas behind this for about seven years. So it's not completely out of the blue. He's been like, proposing things for C++ standardization. Some of them are getting traction, some of them are not. But they're all in CPP2. So if you like those ideas, um, which we don't have time to talk about now, of course, then CPP2 is the one to look for. Uh, another one is VAL, which is um, a language based around value semantics, mutable value semantics, in fact. This is a lot more like um, Rust and Swift, actually, in fact, they're two big inspirations. But it's intended to be simpler to, to reason about than Rust. It's been proposed by Sean Parent and Dave Abrahams, again, two big names in the C++ community. And uh, Dave Abraham has actually been out of C++ for nearly 10 years. He came back in last year. In the meantime, he'd been working at Apple on Swift. He's actually one of the, the designers of the language. And he's taken what he's learned there, what succeeded and what failed, and he's put it into his new language called Val. This is more like a replacement language, I would say more along the lines of Rust. So not strictly a successor, but I think it's interesting anyway. I know there's at least one other one that's <laughs> going to be announced soon which I've sort of heard about through internal channels, so I, I can't talk about it yet. So watch for that. Uh, and of course, at some point, probably <laughs> some, some profit. Um, and that actually brings me to almost the end, other than to say, whatever happens here, C++ is not going anywhere. In fact, all this interest in new languages is feeding back into C++. The committee is taking notice, they're having discussions, it's going to lead to a better C++. So the future of C++ is actually more C++. It's going to be around for a while. Uh, that's my blog, by the way, levelofindirection.com. Uh, I'll probably write this up at some point. If you can't remember that, I've also got extra levelofindirection.com that redirects that. <laughs> but that's the end. Um, thank you very much. Have you got any questions? We've got time. <laughs> So any questions? Take one at the back, I may not be able to hear you. Yeah, I'll shout. Uh, that was really interesting, thank you. Um, out of curiosity, what is the market value for being, if you can crack being a success, uh, success in the C++, is this cash profit? Is this uh, kudos for being like, cracked it? Have you got to do it? I think it depends who you work for. So, yeah. Um, Obviously, C++ is, is an open language, it's not owned by any, any company. How many languages actually charge for use anyway? So, there's no direct monetary value. 
But I think if you are a company that has a, a controlling stake in a language and you can direct it, then you can make it easier for what you want to do. Which is why a lot of people are suspicious about Google's involvement. Because they've actually been one of the companies that's had quite a lot of leverage on C++ already. Uh, and there's a few companies like that. Um, yeah, well, that's really because cool. if you look at Angular as well, right? Google, Sorry? And, well, Google have been chairing and running Angular for the last few right. weeks. Okay. So see what's going on there as well. Which is yeah. good. So that they've got form here. Yeah. So we'll, we'll, we'll see. Um, and you had a yeah. question? So you said that CPP2 transpiled, so you can take the output and you'd be looking at C++, which yeah. is great. Is it going to be part of the sort of organising committee's thinking? Like, hang on, if everybody goes down this road with, say, that, mm -hmm. and we decide, actually, no, that's, that's duff, we're going to kill it off. Is it going to be sort of, well, if you want to carry on down that road, you need to have a way of coming back. Is that sort of going to be sort of thrown at them in a, like, don't forget, people that might pick it up, they might follow it, but you've got to be able to come back, otherwise you could end up with loads of people going, yay, Val, oh, it's dead. Yeah. Of course, when the project's then died too. Uh, yeah, exactly. And uh, all these languages, I should emphasise, they're early stages yet. I think none of them are currently ready to start writing production coding, um, even as an early adopter. But uh, you know, at some point that's going to come, and you might still want that gonna get out clause. Uh, CPP2 is the only one that's really designed that in, okay. um, as far as I know at least, because it's explicitly generating not just generating C++, but there's an emphasis on making it readable and even like trying to preserve your formatting conventions and that sort of thing. So, yeah. We had D about <laughs> 12 years ago? Yes. Maybe more? More. Have we learned any lessons from D? So D was a previous successor to C++. Kind of. Sort of. Um, okay. D. The first version I gave of this talk, which is actually to a C++ meetup, so it's a little bit different, I really did it, but I did actually mention D on there as well as a, <laughs> another attempt to this. Uh, D is slightly different in that it was more a case of, well, the problem to C++ is because it's trying to be backwards compatible with C. What would it have looked like if we didn't try to be source compatible with C? I could actually break some things. I did like a second attempt. But the first version of D, I think it actually came out uh, in the 90s, um, originally, uh, by uh, one of the early C++ compiler authors. And it was very much a, a 90s child, uh, very sort of OO focused, very well done, uh, fixed a lot of the problems, but didn't really you know, take, take us forward until one of the other um, sort of big lights in the C++ world, Andre Alexandrescu became interested and he took, sort of took over the direction, future direction, in D2 was a, a much more impressive language with um, uh, generics and metaprogramming and, uh, and that sort of thing. And it looked like on the cusp of breaking through, but then they had this, this, this big problem where they had two competing standard libraries and it sort of destroyed most people's interest in, in the whole thing and it was too late before they came out of that. So. Yeah, I think D has had its run and it's didn't quite succeed. I mean, it's still there. People are still writing D. Yeah. So you said it works on the AST level rather than so carbon. Yes. So I'm guessing that it's uh, it's actually able to take advantage of being able to do some proper nice linking with templates and things like that, where it can get around. So no one big problems of interoperability between languages that have to stay generics and things like that is that because you get to it, they get to link it all together too late, they miss all the performance advantages they might have otherwise. Yeah, yeah, so um, believe that the compiler front end, in fact, the, um, yeah. the, the AST, so once you built the AST, you merge them together, then that gets optimised and then code generated and then linked, so you yeah. several stages in front of that. Uh, and definitely get the optimization, or in theory, get the optimization opportunities. But the one thing that I haven't seen a good answer to yet is why Carbon wouldn't suffer the same problem that Epochs had. Calling between different versions of C++ alone, if that's a problem, yeah. why would a different syntax not have a similar problem? But they may have an answer for that, but I haven't found it yet. Uh, 
one of you two. <laughs> <laughs> you just like. Hi. Um, so, this probably isn't a well articulated question, so I'm not entirely sure of the semantics. Um, in the Java ecosphere before Docker, there was a lot of fighting about how on earth do we lose, use these machines with gigabytes of RAM and loads of CPU. And they came up with OSGI. <laughs> and the result of that was dynamic linking and trying to get things as interoperable as possible. What they were trying to emulate was effectively um, the linker layer you have in C, where you can do dynamic loading and plug-in compatibility using like Gold Linker, etc. And, and then I guess in Windows you've got like the, the CLR to kind of help support some of that. One of the things I look at C and C++, I think they've got good capabilities for dynamic linking and plug-in support. When you look at Carbon and what's coming next, are they looking at how to involve the linkers? I think there's a missing gap. There was something where, like 20 years ago, people were talking about Corba and trying to get interoperability that way, and then everything's going to go, well, we can't do anything at this layer, we're just going to go microservices and rest because we can't solve it. Do these try and solve that problem? I've not heard any talk in the context of carbon. I don't think it's really a carbon thing so much as a just the, the C++ ecosystem in general, which carbon would be a part of, um, you know, the, the linkers and, and how they work and dynamic linking. Uh, but I will say that to take it as far as um, Java has, it would probably need some sort of uh, JIT support uh, to be able to optimize across component boundaries. That's one thing that you, you can't do with C++ at the moment. That's going to be more important for some things than others. I'm not sure you I think it's, it's more that the API compatibility, like mm -hmm. being able to sustain API compatibility with a linker, like yeah. you, you can still dynamically load a new module that's still compatible with something that was compiled right. yeah. 10 okay. years ago. So yeah, it does seem to be a topic that has cooled off a bit. I wouldn't say that uh, we've given up on it. Um, I think COM was pretty successful. It's not particularly modern now. Uh, maybe Corbel was an attempt to go a bit further that went too far. Um, <laughs> one of the papers that came up in the last couple of years that didn't seem to get anywhere, but was really interesting anyway, did seem to have a, a stab at addressing that by saying, well, this is the layout of this version of this interface. And if you've got the new version, it's a slightly different layout, and here's how to map between the two. And I could see that sort of thing being used to offer ABI stability between components as well as, well, it's the same thing really, whether it's a library or a plugin, it's the, the binary layout uh, in memory. So I'd like to see more um, going on there, but so far it doesn't seem to have got a lot of interest, I agree. We have a problem in the Rust world at the moment where most of the projects you pretty much have to build the world. And whilst you can cache it, you're kind of caching against the specific compiler version. Hmm. Yeah, but well, that's well that's another big problem with C that Carbon is trying to address by being more modules based. Um, but okay, well, we'll see how that actually works out in practice. Yes. So this isn't Google's first attempt for writing systems language. No. Any thoughts about how the Go project and how that's going over the years? And uh, well, my view is that um, uh, they, they tried to release a second version and nobody liked it. I'm just waiting for somebody say, to say, go to considered harmful. <laughs> um, but no, you're asking the wrong person. I've never been a Go fan, um, particularly with the, the lack of generics. But it's, it's, um, it's got a different focus. And I think it's still quite popular in some spheres, but other languages are even C++, are starting to get really good at Go steps. And there may not be much reason for people to adopt Go once other languages really catch up, you know, particularly around you know, concurrency and co-routines. Co um, so we'll see, but maybe that's why Google are <laughs> trying to get on for the next second. Yeah. Oh, good <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So one of the um, so I don't know about my like security hat on. Um, I can see. So one, of the, one of the challenges we've always had with C++ is it does 
make it very difficult to write secure codes if you don't know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Are there, you know, looking at the, the, the after C++, are we looking at better ways to write that type of code in a more secure way? Are we going to still have the same sort of security challenges? So, an excellent question, which addresses some that I really skipped over okay. in the material. Um, first of all, the best way to, to write secure C++ code is to use uh, Solid in, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that. I had to get that in. Yeah. Um, but no, one of the big differences between both Carbon and CPP2 and VAL is that Carbon and CPP2, because their core principle is backwards compatibility in some form with C++, they also still suffer, to a large extent, the same problems with undefined behaviour um, and other areas that, that can lead to, to vulnerabilities. But they try to clean it up to some degree and fixing the defaults helps a lot. And they've got plans in the future, but they're starting from an inherently unsafe, safer but still not safe position. Whereas Val is going even further than Rust, I believe, in saying, no, we are safe by default. There is an unsafe keyword, but it's designed in such a way that you can I don't know if I'd say trivially, but fairly easily write safe code in terms of unsafe code. Um, that's what they say, I've not <laughs> had experience enough with it yet to, to say whether that's the case, but certainly it's safe by default um, in, a, in a way that's easier to reason about than, than even Rust. So I think Val is the one that stands out as being a better bet if security is your main concern. <coughs> At the moment, um, things that are very vulnerable still tend to be written in C or C++, so it could be a long time before we can convince them to move to something like that. Whereas getting them to move to something like CPP2 or Carbon may be an easier sell. So maybe safer is still better than safe, but we can't get there. Do we have time for any more? Uh, I'm going to stop it there, if that's okay. Yep, yeah, okay. Thank you very much.